Welcome to Energy 142, class number two. Uh, in this class, we're really going to talk about some key terms and concepts in energy accounting and why um, we're billed the way we are. So we're going to start um, with sort of a general definition of a utility grid. So um, what generation, transmission, and distribution are. So you can sort of see here we have a picture of um, a general utility grid. We have a power station. And that's usually connected to a big transmission network. And those are usually the really big wires, and they travel at high voltage. And then we have the distribution lines, which are a little lower voltage, and they come right to our homes or businesses usually. Sometimes really big businesses or, or factories um, are connected right to the transmission networks. And then we have the, sub, uh, the transformers and substations. And you might have seen these along the side of the road or um, in other places. And those are just uh, to step up or to step down the voltage. It turns out we want really high voltage when we travel long distances with electricity. So that's the idea. That's how. Um, that's the main the main three things. So the generation of the power station, the transmission, which over is usually transmits electricity over long distances, and the distribution, which is short distances. So a big thing happened um, a couple decades back, um, and it's called deregulation. So what happened is um, it used to be that everything was owned um, by a central utility, which the generation, the transmission, and the distribution. Now the distribution is, is um, centrally owned and, and um, owned by the utility, and it's Delmarva Power in our area. So the distribution is completely owned by Delmarva Power. But the transmission and generation um, is an open market. So, for example, this is from um, a company called Clean Currents that you can um, you can um, buy your transmission and your generation from. So you'll see that a lot of times that um, on utility bills, the electric supplier is not the same um, as the um, the um, distribution um, network. So distribution and all the electricity bills we'll look at as Delmarva, but the electric supplier is going to be different, and I'll come back to that um, when we talk about uh, utility utility bills uh, next time. So the main idea with deregulation is distribution is um, always your local electric utility and that's a monopoly. So that's completely owned by a local electricity, um, local electric utility. And transmission and generation is um, an open market. So another thing um, about the utility grid is that um, the electricity grid must balance usage and generation at all times, so 24-7, 365 days of the year. Um, so for fossil fuels, we, what happens is is that you know we can just vary the amount of fossil fuel um, generation at different times by putting more coal in the fire, putting more natural gas, um, and and we'll talk a little bit about how renewable generation is going to change that um, also. So let's look at um, sort of a you know a picture of of a simulated grid. Um, and, and we'll go over it a little bit to figure out um, how the grid sort of works um, in, a, in, in a normal time. So this is um, in the spring, and it's the Western um, United States grid. And the left-hand axis is megawatts, and the um, bottom axis is time. And you can see it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So what happens is, is that um, at all times, we want to run our nuclear and coal plants. So the nuclear is the black and the coal is the gray. And then um, we fill in the peaks with different things. Now, um, the, pr the purple is a natural gas combined cycle plant. You don't need to worry about what combined cycle means, but purple is just basically natural gas. So the natural gas we can turn up and down pretty easily here. And then we also have in the west, we have a lot of hydropower, so that's what the peaks are filled in. So what you can see here, basically what we're doing is during the high peak usage, we just ramp up and ramp down our power plants. So um, it's the same thing in the summer, but we need a little bit more power in the summer. Um, you can see um, that the peaks are a little bit higher, and so what we do is the red is another type of natural gas. So what we call baseload generation, baseload is the ones that are on basically all the time, so the nuclear and the coal. Um, and then I would say the combined cycle is probably baseload, even though it's a little bit of difference. And then the peak load generation would be the hydroelectric and the um, gas turbines here. So what happens is, is the gas turbines, this red, it's the most expensive um, turbine, or it's the most expensive thing the utility runs. So that's why they only run it during the peak times. So if they could get away with it, what the utility would want is a totally flat 
line here. So the um, demand of electricity was totally flat because then they wouldn't have to build any of these red power plants or they have, wouldn't, wouldn't have to um, use the hydroelectric here either. So um, from a utility standpoint, the peaks every day are a challenge and it just increases their costs. So they would, would want as flat as possible. So this is basically a couple different ways the utility tries to make customers, um, and, and whether it be businesses or, or factories or, or homes, um, to help lower their peak. And we'll talk about these more in the, in, in the video. Um, the first is demand response. The second is time of use rates. The third is block or tiered rates. And the fourth is demand charges with or without ratchets. So the first thing I want to talk about is demand response. So what I want you to do is, uh, this is uh, from Delmarva, they have a new program that um, for residential demand response. So I want you to click on the link um, that's going to pop up on this video here. And um, just watch and, and, and think about how that would help utilities lower their peak. So now that you've watched the residential um, video, here's a um, definition um, from PJM. So PJM is um, basically um, the, the transmission and um, generation marketplace for the whole Northeast. So remember how we said um, transmission and um, generation was deregulated, so it's an open market. Well, PJM is that market. So you can think of it sort of like a stock market um, for, for all of those things. So this is a, a you know intense definition, but let's just think about um, a little bit of what this is saying. So basically, it's a term used to describe programs in which customers receive payments or incentives to temporarily curtail their power usage. So all that means is that there's a bunch of di there's there's programs. So utilities have programs where customers, so you know homeowners or businesses, receive payments. So they receive money or other maybe financial incentives to curtail their power usage, which basically means just cut back. So for example, Delaware Tech sometimes in the summer um, raises their um, raises their temp temperature of all their thermostats and all the all the staff and faculty get an email when that happens. So sometimes this this is done directly. So sometimes Delmarva can just call the customer directly. And sometimes it's done through a curtailment service provider. So um, an example of this is uh, Constellation Energy. And they um, enroll customers. So Constellation might say, give us control of your thermostats, and most of the time we won't touch them, but several times of peak power um, throughout the year, we may um, raise those those temperatures. Um, so there's a lots lots of different options about this, um, and and so it's, it's really you know something that all businesses and 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 whatnot should look into, um, to what options going to be best for them. Um, so so that's the idea with uh, demand response. So the next thing that we could look at is uh, time of use rates. So this is an example of Wilmington, Delaware, um, time of use rate structure. Um, and you can see that there's the rates are different for the times of the day. And remember, so what, we're, what the utilities are trying to do is lower their peak. And their highest peak is summertime and during the day. So if we can see the number one is summertime, June, July, August, September, and it's during the day, 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. And that's the highest cost. That's 24 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, it turns out that summer at night is um, pretty high peak for Delmarva as well. So summer at night is the two here, and that's almost as much, 22 cents a kilowatt hour. It's because air conditioning and whatnot's running um, during this time at, uh, at night. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This is the peak during the day at winter. That's why that's, uh, that's high. The two is the peak during the day at winter. And then at night is the three and four, which are a little bit lower. So we can see it's about 11 cents um, at night. So about 20 more than 20 cents during the day, a little bit higher in the summer than the winter, and about 11 cents at night. So a more drastic um, rate structure is here. It's the Phoenix time of use rate structure. So we can see here that, um, first off, the highest cost is 49 cents, and that's period 8, which is actually a very narrow period. It's June, July, and August from 3 to 5 p.m. And you can imagine it's really hot in Phoenix, Arizona at that time. So there's a big pressure on the air conditioning systems. And then period 7 is right next to it, 
it drops precipitously to only 24 cents a kilowatt hour. So there's really, really sharp defined peaks in Phoenix, Arizona, and that's why um, there's all of these different periods in this time of use rate structure. And we can see that uh, period three, six, and nine are five cents a kilowatt hour. They're very low. So three, six, and nine are in the middle of the night. And you might know that in a desert, it gets cold, much colder at night. So the air conditioning really isn't working. So it's a very low, um, low valley here. So that's why Phoenix has more of a defined time of use rate structure. So now that we've talked about time of use rates, the next thing we're going to talk about is block or tiered rates. So this is another way that utilities can really try to manage, um, you know, electricity use. Um, but it's not necessarily, this isn't necessarily lowering the peak too much, but this is lowering, um, you know, it's just a way to help them control um, their costs and whatnot. So one example here is that maybe the first 20,000 kilowatt hours you use, you're billed at a rate of, um, you know, about 5.65 cents per kilowatt hour. And then the next 50,000 kilowatt hours you're used at a lower cost, which is 4.5 cents per kilowatt hour. And then if you have greater than 70,000 kilowatt hours, maybe you're billed at an even lower cost. So this is just saying the more you use, the lower rate you're going to pay. Um, so this is one way a utility can sort of incentivize you to use more. Um, so there's also, this type is called a um, declining um, declining blocker tiered rate structure because as you use more, the cost declines. So an inverted one is as you use more, the cost increases. And inverted are being more and more um, implemented because that incentivizes um, energy efficiency, which is something that is, is really important. So inverted rate structures are something that um, policymakers can use to really um, try to make you uh, more energy efficient. Um, so you'll, you'll see those um, coming up a lot too. Next thing we're going to talk about is demand charges. So demand charges are, are charged to almost um, every customer, especially commercial customer, and um, more and more they're being charged to residential customers. So demand charge is not the charge for the amount of energy you use. It's for your peak power consumption in the, in the month. So um, even if you use um, an average of one kilowatt for most of the month, and then it spikes to 20 kilowatts, maybe on a really hot day, um, you turn on all your air conditioning, then you're going to be charged for that 20 kilowatts, even though most of the month you're only using one. So it's the charge per peak kilowatt, and usually it's a monthly peak kilowatt. And we'll talk a little bit about um, the different ways they, they measure, utilities measure this peak kilowatt. So um, so that's it's usually just the peak month kilowatt, but sometimes you can be charged for your yearly peak demand all year. So this is called a ratchet. So let me give you, ratchet's a little bit weird, so let me give you an example to try to flush this out a little bit. So let's say um, your demand in June, so your peak demand is 800 kilowatts, and you pay $5 per kilowatt. So that means you pay $4,000 in the demand charge for June. Okay, then the following December, your peak um, is going to be 150 kilowatts. So you know, if you were thinking logically, you'd say, okay, well, I should just be charged for the 150 kilowatts. But what happens, and that would just be um, $750. But what happens a lot of times is that instead of being charged for um, your peak in that month, you're charged for your yearly, your, your summertime peak or your yearly peak, and you're charged a percentage of that peak. So in this example, um, you're charged 60% of that peak, which is in 480 kilowatts, and times five dollars per kilowatt, which equals 2,400 dollars. So this can your your summertime peak can really, um, you know, affect your bill all year long. So let me give you a, a real example of um, a demand ratchet, um, and this is for um, a school um, in the area. So here's the demand ratchet example from a high school. So we can see that um, they have a peak summer demand and a total kilowatt billing demand here. So their peak summer demand was 573 kilowatts. And what they actually used this month was 236. So they actually used 236, but what they're going to be billed for is 551, which again is just a percentage, and it depends on your utility rate, of the peak summer demand. And so you can see the charges here. Instead of the 236, they're charged for the 551 kilowatts. 
So you can see that's that's how you can lo sort of locate it on a bill. A lot of times they'll have something like peak summer demand and the total kilowatt billing demand, but then that'll usually be higher than what your off-peak demand was used. So that's sort of how they how they come up with that um, thing. So what we want to do is, I just want to show you a simple example problem um, for how you can um, reduce, if you reduce the summertime peak, how much of an effect it can have. So here's the example problem. So we can see from the previous slide that the high school was charged at $2.45 per kilowatt peak. And this was ratcheted all year long at 100% of their peak. We're just going to say it was 100% even though it was probably closer to 90. If the school was able to lower their peak by 100 kilowatts, how much money would the school save in a year? So just think about in the summer months, maybe they could lower their peak somehow by 100 kilowatts, um, maybe by um, turning some lights off or doing doing lots of doing a couple other things, um, raising the temperature in the school or whatnot. So let's just if we take that hypothetical question, they lowered it. We know they have $2.45 per kilowatt month, and then we multiply by 100 kilowatts, and then I said for a whole year, so times 12 months in a year, and this is going to be, you're going to save, if we do all the unit conversions, this is $2,940 per year. So that's how much the school would save just by lowering their peak for one day in the summer, basically. If they lower their peak for 100 kilowatts for that one um, big day. So that's a big reduction you can get just by lowering your peak. So just as a review, we talked about um, demand response, time of use rates, block or tiered rates, and demand charges with or without ratchets as ways utilities can really reduce their peak. So we also want to talk about um, sort of the future of this because this is what's coming up and it will happen in, in the span of your career probably. So right now the peaks are, um, you know, the generation peaks are during the day. And it's always better to have lower demand during the day, especially on hot and cold days. But the big question is, will that always be the case? So let's look at a case that may change things. And this is going to be for uh, renewable um, energy. So we can see that in this case, instead of our normal you know, coal and nuclear and natural gas, we have a new color in here, and that's green. So green is wind. And wind is weird because wind... Um, produces more electricity when it's windy and produces less when it's not windy. So we really have to have a lot of other, um, the grid is going to be much different in the future. And so these um, time of use rates and demand ratchets and everything may change once renewables um, start making up a bigger portion of the grid. Because you may just want to um, cut energy use when it's not windy. Or if you have a big solar um, um, state or region, you may want to cut um, energy use on the days when it's really hot but not sunny. So it may not always be that, um, you know, that these times of cutting energy use are, are during the day or very defined as they are now. So another sort of version of the future of the grid is here, where instead of, you know, just just uh, having some fossil fuels, this is completely renewable generation, which is the blue. And then we also have, uh, I'm sorry, which is the green. And then we also have storage, which is the gray. So, um, and at some points, our renewable generation is above our um, our usage, and it's going to be pumped into batteries or or something else, some sort of other energy storage. And then when we don't have much renewable generation, it's going to be come out of storage. So that's the other thing that might be on the horizon is uh, large scale energy storage on the grid. So it's something else you might see in your career. The last thing I want to talk about a little bit is load factor, because it's an important measurement for how peaky um, energy usage. So remember, so um, and then let me say that one more time. Load factor is very important for how peaky energy use is. It's not how much energy use you have, but it's how big your um, peak is in comparison with the rest. So um, if you have a very flat energy usage throughout a period, a time period, your load factor is relatively close to one. And if you, so one is the highest load factor you can have. If you have a completely flat line, it, the load factor is one. If you have a relatively low, low load factor, that means your peak is very pronounced. 
so you have uh, um, a very high peak in comparison to your average energy usage. We'll talk more about this, but um, you could think about certain types of buildings that would have high load factors and low load factors. So um, high load factors are very peaky, so that would be things that completely shut down at night um, and then have very high peaks. And I, I think one of, the, one of the main things might be a um, conference center or something like that that's not utilized too often, but sometimes is completely filled with people and, and um, you know the air conditioning is pumping full throttle or something like that. Um, a low load factor means it's a relatively constant um, energy usage, remember. So relatively constant energy usage, maybe something like a Wawa that's 24-7 or what, whatnot. So um, we can think about that. Um, so and, and, and so when you're thinking about it, you're going to be doing this for your schools. So if a school had a load factor of 0.8, that probably would not be normal because that's going to be even flatter than this line here. So um, a school should really have some peaks during the day and should be turning off um, most things at night. So a school with a load factor of 0.8 would probably not be normal. So again, like I said before, we're going to calculate the load factor, and it's going to be in task two of your project. Um, we'll go over how to do the calculation later in the class. I just wanted to introduce you to the topic now. And that's it for, task, or, uh, for class two.